I started working with networks really in 1986. I was the director of academic computing at Northwestern. Uh, stayed there for four years and went to New York University and ran academic computing there for 10 years. In 1992, in 1991, uh, I joined the Internet Society as a result of Vince Cerf announcing it at the National Net Conference. In 92, I went to the uh, INET 92 conference in Kobe, and there were a group of Africans who had been um, t uh, brought there by Stefano Trumpi and Enzo Pugliati, two Italians, uh, in order to teach Africans about uh, uh, the Internet. And I realized that this was a uh, a really important thing to do. I had worked previously in the UN for 13 years doing uh, uh, doing technology transfer, and I'd worked in about 20 countries in Africa. And uh, it was important to get the internet to these countries. So we, uh, I and a group of maybe 15 volunteers, started the Internet Society workshop for students from developing countries. And we, in 93, which is the first year we held it, uh, we, um, uh, we had 130-some people from almost 70 countries. We ran a five-day, five-day, six-day workshop at Stanford University. Uh, and uh, by the time that series had ended, in 2001, we had trained 1,500 people uh, and, uh, in network technology, how to connect your country to the Internet, how to set up routed networks, how to do resource discovery, content resource discovery on the net, and how to serve content, and how to manage national networks. pretty clear from the beginning that the internet was going to be a, a, a breakthrough technology and um, I think it was just a matter of rough slogging all the way through every year training more people uh, helping them to go back to their countries um, of course most of them had email and once you have email then you can communicate with everybody else and so the workshops didn't stop when they left uh, they essentially set up their own information networks traded information back and forth and uh, uh, helped to bring the internet to their countries. Vince Cerf said that uh, those workshops sped up the introduction to the internet uh, in these countries by two to three years. Uh, that was sort of a breakthrough observation on his part. I didn't think it was doing that much good, but um, uh, it was, uh, I guess in the whole, it was an impressive thing. Uh, and um, uh, there were a lot of volunteers who helped. We spread the internet culture. We, re we realized that we were spreading not only the technology, but the culture. And at that point, the culture was largely defined by the academic and research environment, uh, which was sharing of information, helping people, a non-competitive, cooperative uh, learning and, uh, uh, and teaching. And that was, I think, I don't know if that was a breakthrough or not, but it was a very satisfying environment in which to work. Let's talk about ask. Let's talk about asking the right question. Okay. That's that's a terrible question. Is it? it is. <laughs> Please elaborate. <laughs> because it's um, it, it 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 assumes a one dimension, a one unidimensionality uh -huh. to the progress of the internet. And in fact, there are very significant uh, dimensions to the internet: uh, the technology, the policy, uh, all the. the um, uh, the geographic spread, uh, the uses of it, uh, the, uh, the issues of uh, mal, uh, malware, malfeasance and crime on the internet, etc. And the rate of progress, if, if one can call it that. Hopes and fears are uh, uh, very emotional words. Let me talk about concerns and uh, observations. Okay. Um, one of the concerns is whether this internet structure is sufficiently robust to be able to stand the attacks of people who use it for their own purposes that are not necessarily good. And this comes from the initial design, which was uh, to be used in, in a uh, cooperative group of researchers and academics. Uh, so that the issue of authentication was never taken really seriously. So, for example, right now it's quite possible to spoof somebody's name on an email. You know this. You've probably gotten those emails. Um, and uh, 
so you don't really know, uh, just to stay at the email level, although we could go further, you don't really know who sent you that email. And most of the time, you know, you, you, you have a context in which you can interpret what you get. But uh, there's no guarantee. Um, so that people are going to be able to go on the, uh, the um, network anonymously, uh, spoofing, using uh, somebody else's name, and do bad things. Uh, we have no, no good defense against that right now. Uh, the alternative would have been an internet with very strong authentication so that you could be sure that if you got a message from someone, it would be from that someone and no one else. It's very hard to retrofit this back. Uh, and among, of course, among a group of cooperative scientists, you don't need that. Among six billion people on the planet, you absolutely do need it, and we don't have it. So the concern is uh, the robustness of the current internet in the absence of considerably stronger uh, uh, authentication of individuals. Um, in terms of the hope, I think the internet's well on its way to becoming a utility. Uh, costs come down uh, not only for internet service but also for the terminal equipment uh, th that's used, uh, and typically before six or seven years ago it was a computer, now it's often a mobile phone, and so you can get access to the internet through devices, some of which remain to be uh, invented, uh, that are fairly cheap and fairly uh, uh, versatile. So, so that one should, I would hope that 10 or 20 years from now, uh, we live in a world in which internet access is taken almost for granted, and that it's conceivable that the internet, the name internet, will actually fade uh, and we'll just consider it part of the infrastructure that we're used to, just like, um, you know, there'll be a plug in the wall for, internet, for, for information services over the internet. There's a plug in the wall for electricity. Um, we don't have an electricity society. Uh, we do have an internet society. Will the internet society continue? What will its focus be as the internet becomes part of the infrastructure for the whole world? A lot of those actions are being taken now. Um, uh, in ICANN, we are hardening the domain name system so that it is much less capable of misuse than it was before. Um, we need uh, countries to understand what the internet is and what it isn't. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens there, of course, is that the internet, by encouraging free flow of information, uh, goes against the, uh, the governmental regimes that really don't believe in that and, and restrict information from getting to the people who live within its uh, boundaries. So, so it's a much larger question about, about what, what issues can, uh, sorry, what, what actions can we take uh, to ensure the free flow of information. And one of them is working with governments, uh, uh, and that's not only the Internet Society and people like you, like I, I can, but also other governments and the entire civil society movement uh, to loosen the boundaries uh, that restrict information from flowing. Uh, this is probably a never-ending fight, and what we can hope to do is ameliorate the current situation, uh, and maybe 100 or 200 years from now, uh, the, uh, it won't be so much of an issue anymore. That it's also clear that we are in an adolescent phase of learning to, uh, to use the Internet. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, we were in infancy. Now we're, we're flexing, the Internet's flexing its muscle. Uh, of course, that, you know, that's an anthropomorphic uh, way of describing it. People are, are feeling uh, very empowered to use the internet to try new things. That's a better way of saying it. And some of those things are, uh, uh, are pretty bad, but most of them, I think, are uh, very promising in terms of, of helping human intellect or human, uh, uh, human development, economic and social development, especially in developing countries. Uh, the issue about using it well is, uh, it's a thorny issue because what's a good use for one person is not necessarily a good use for another. But um, I remember in Athens in 2006 at the first Internet Governance Forum, there was a youth panel. And the moderator uh, put a question to the panel, uh, you know, what do you and your fellows use the Internet for? 
uh, and uh, he, he didn't follow a lawyer's maxim, which was don't ask a question unless you know the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the answer came back. Uh, from several people. Oh, we use it for email, we use it to play games, we like to look at pornography. Uh, and uh, uh, w without missing a beat, the, the, uh, the conversation went on. And, uh, you know, you think that uh, uh, there are a lot of people who have invested a lot of time to, to bring the Internet to people. And if you're really only, only going to use it for that, why did we do this? So the, the issue, I think, is, is, to, is to sensitize people to the strong benefits that can be brought, but which don't have to be uh, uh, used. You can use it, it's like any technical tool, uh, any technical uh, advance. You can use it for good, you can use it for evil, you can use it for, um, for silly things. Uh, but um, th this tool is much more powerful than most others and and it's important that we also try to sensitize people to what can be done on it uh, and how they can improve lives their own or other people's or whatever